Is there such a thing as virtue? And what does it mean to live a virtuous life? Furthermore, what does science and philosophy have to say about it? This and more coming up next on Beyond Belief. So Dr. Pellucci, you um, are a philosopher and um, which is an unusual profession, I would say in today's world. And you are a, <laughs> uh, you're a person who promotes philosophy and reason. And um, one of the things that you have spoken about is the concept of virtue, which I'd like to focus on a little bit today. And um, the, the book of yours I'm most familiar with is called Answers for Aristotle, which I loved. Thank you. Um, and in it, you say, to be virtuous means to rise above one's weaknesses, to do the right thing, both for ourselves and for others. And obviously that, that seems like a very reasonable, um, probably commonly accepted thing to say, but it, it did raise actually four questions that I have um, on it. And I don't know, I don't want to belabor the point for too, too long, but let's just see how it goes. But the first question I would have is, what does it mean to do the right thing? What, what is the right thing by itself? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Of course, the answer there depends in part, but I want to stress only in part, on which particular philosophical or religious tradition one belongs to. And the reason I want to stress, in other words, there is cultural variation uh, about what is the right thing to do in any particular circumstance. However, the reason I like to stress the in part is because actually there is a lot of more commonality between uh, in, uh, traditions and, and different philosophies and different religions about what broadly speaking the right thing to do is so for instance uh, you know a stoic philosopher and, uh, and a buddhist practitioner might disagree on specific instances and then they might have to have a conversation about what the right thing to do is but broadly speaking they both agreed that we should be helping other people that we should be reducing suffering uh, that we should uh, act in a pro-social uh, manner uh, and so on and so forth so i would stress the agreement rather than the disagreement of course the disagreements are important they, they are a lot of what ethics is actually about but but so long as we accept the notion that ethics is not entirely arbitrary, that there is a lot of uh, variation, culturally speaking, but that doesn't mean that it is arbitrary. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, there is one ethics in Rome and another, another one in New York, uh, then, uh, then we're on to something. If, on the other hand, we disagree with that, if we start from a completely relativistic position about ethics, uh, then it seems to me that there is pretty much no conversation to be had. Right. I understand. Uh, and that makes sense. Um, okay. So you also said you have to rise above one's weaknesses in order to do the right thing, whatever that right thing may be. And you say there is probably a broad consensus generally of what that thing is, but that would seem to imply that human nature is, is not equipped naturally to do this. Mm -hmm. So would you say that we are built that way? That are, is there some fundamental disagreement between our nature and, and this ideal of doing that which is right. Right. Well, there too, there actually is disagreement among different traditions, right? So the Christians, for instance, tend to think that human beings are pretty bad in the first place. Right? It's like, you know, we really are not, are not doing very well. So it requires a lot of effort on our part to even approximate doing the right thing. The Stoics, on the other hand, uh, by contrast, and a lot of the uh, ancient Greek and Romans, thought that actually pretty much human nature is fundamentally good. We are fundamentally pro-social. We're fundamentally cooperative. Uh, but then we, we make mistakes. Uh, then we get into some certain habits that, are, that undermine our fundamental goodness. And so we need to work on this. And we need to sort of recover uh, our, our way. Uh, for instance, uh, the Roman Stoic Seneca actually wrote that virtue is, virtue is nothing other than right reason. And so uh -huh. he says, you know, if you just think about it, and if, if you think about how you would want to be treated by other people, and then make the, the very short leap to, well, other people probably want to be treated in the same way, then you're already more than half away where you should be. So you just need to use your, your reasoning abilities to figure out uh, what, what to do and, and, and what to stay away from. I, I actually have a question about Seneca, but I'm going to come back to that uh, a little bit later. And I'm glad you mentioned it. 
But uh, two more quick things on virtue, um, which are, you talk about the contribution of science. We're gonna, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more uh, also to the development of philosophy and the relationship between the two things. And part of that is evolutionary theory. My question for you is, in your estimation as a philosopher reflecting on the science, why would evolution have selected these negative traits in humanity? These, you know, these the the, the desire to do that something that which is inimical to our own well-being or to society's well-being. Doesn't it seem like an odd phenomenon that we that, that it didn't select out the best qualities for us to to have very naturally and very easily? That, that's sort of part one. And part two, if you don't mind, is is Anne Rand. I just wanted to throw her into the mix. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she said the highest virtue is to do for one's self, right? right. So she's, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to make of her sometimes. Sometimes I like what she says. Sometimes I'm totally baffled. But the question is, how do we know that she wasn't correct? Maybe that is a higher virtue than doing for others. Maybe your yourself is the most important thing to focus on. Right. Okay, that's interesting. You brought up Ayn Rand. Yeah, we'll we'll get to her in a, in a minute. Um, <laughs> okay. So let's go first to evolution. So before I turned to philosophy a number of years ago, I actually was an evolutionary biologist, and and so that is um, that has given me a, a, a different way of looking at things compared to uh, some of my colleagues in in philosophy. I think that evolution. So the, the question is, you know, why does it, why did evolution not uh, eliminate certain traits that are not good for us. Well, the question is, what is good for us? And from the point of view of natural selection, there is only two things that matter, survival and reproduction. In fact, there really is only one thing that matters, reproduction. Survival is because if you don't survive, usually you don't reproduce. Generally, uh, yes. Right, generally speaking. <laughs> uh, so, so it, you know, natural selection clearly doesn't care. Well, technically doesn't care about anything because it's not a sentient, sentient thing, but doesn't care, metaphorically speaking, about flourishing, about uh, achieving you know, satisfa personal satisfaction, about wealth, about uh, anything other than things that are instrumental for survival and reproduction. Now, therefore, I would think that basing an ethics entirely and exclusively on natural selection would be a bad idea. However, Ignoring natural selection, you know, ignoring evolution is also a bad idea. And the reason for that, I think, again, goes back to uh, one of the fundamental ideas that were developed by the Greco-Roman uh, philosophers, especially the Stoics, but also the Epicureans. They thought that we should live, as they put it, according to nature. Uh -huh. Right. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we should all of a sudden strip naked and go into the forest and hug trees, although... Nothing wrong with that if you want to do it, but that's not what they meant. What they meant was, look, we are human beings. If the question here is to try to figure out what is a good life for a human being, then we need to understand the basics of human nature. Because you cannot possibly work toward a good life unless you actually take into account uh, what human nature entails and what kind of needs uh, and wants are typical of human beings. So let me, let me give you a completely... Uh, different example. Let's say that um, a friend of yours comes over for dinner and brings you as a present a cactus. Okay. So now you are in charge of the cactus. And in order for the cactus to thrive, in order for you to allow the, the, the cactus to thrive, you have to know something about cactus nature. The first obvious thing you have to know is that it's a plant and therefore it needs water and, and light, among other things. But just as importantly, you actually need to know that it's not just a plant, it's a desert plant which means that it requires a lot of light and actually fairly little water. If you start watering your cactus on a regular basis, as if it were another house plant, you're going to kill it. Why? Because you didn't take cactus nature into account. So the Stoics and the Epicureans, even though they themselves disagreed on the, on the fine details of, of these things, that, well, the same goes for a human being. If, if my question is, what is a good life for a human being? What the Greeks called the eudaimonic life, a life worth living, uh, then I had to ask myself, what is a human being in the first place? According to the Stoics, a human being is, a, is characterized, of course, by a number of things that we have in common with other animals, right? We, we need food, we need water, we need protection, we want sex. All of those things are in common with other animals. And they do need to be taken care of. You, you, you're not going to have a good life uh, if you're starving or, or, or dying of thirst or anything like that. 
But then they also ask themselves, yes, but what is specifically human that you either don't find in other animals or you find to a much, much lesser degree? In other words, what is it makes a human a particular kind of animal just, just in the way in which a cactus is a particular type of plant and not just a genetic plant? And the answer there was, according to the Stoics, two things. We are highly prosocial, we're highly cooperative, and uh, we are capable of reason. In fact, in modern terms, we would say that social life and reason are the two weapons that natural selection gave us in order to survive and reproduce, right? We don't have big teeth. We don't have large muscles. We don't run fast. We don't fly. We don't do any of the stuff that other animals do. But what we do is we cooperate in a very highly coordinated, complex fashion with other human beings in order to achieve our goals. And we use reason. We have a very sophisticated ability to reason, far more than any other animal on earth. So for the Stoics, for instance, therefore, from this follows that a good human life, the kind of life that we want uh, to have for every human being, is one in which we're capable of ex exercising reason. And we do so mostly in, uh, with the scope, with the, with the objective of improving social living. And that gets me to Ayn Rand. So if that's true, then Ayn Rand is wrong. And, <laughs> right. okay. and Ayn Rand is wrong for the simple reason that um, it is certainly the case, of course, that we do things for ourselves. I mean, we, we do want to thrive. You know, I want to thrive as a person. I want to not only survive and perhaps reproduce. I mean, I do have one daughter. Um, but I also want to thrive. I, do know, I want to do things that are interesting to me, et cetera, et cetera. But because I am an in inherently social animal, those things are simply not possible if I start looking out only for number one. I have to be cooperative because that is the nature of human life. So in a sense, yes, ultimately, everything we do is because we want to survive, reproduce, and have a good life. But we cannot do that by acting self in a selfish fashion because we're not solitary animals. If we were a different kind of animal, you know, let's say a Martian comes in tomorrow and it turns out the Martians did not evolve as social animals, then they would have a different kind of ethics. Uh, or in fact, they might not have an ethics at all uh, in that sense. I mean, this, let's not forget that ethics, although today we understand ethics and morality in general as limited to the study of right and wrong, right? So, so the typical thing is you ask an ethical or moral question, well, is this action right or wrong? That's pretty much what we think today. But in uh, Greco-Roman times, rightly, I think, ethics and, and morality, morality, which is just the Latin translation of ethics from, mm -hmm. from the Latin, right? So it's uh, Cicero that just translated ethicos as moralis. So the two were essentially equivalent. And, and as you're speaking, I'm just thinking like uh, human beings strike me as very schizophrenic, you know, um, having these very different kinds of needs and, you know, often agreeing on these overarching sort of lofty goals and often falling quite sh short of, of reaching those goals um, and sort of indulging in these more base aspects, you know, of our of ourselves. But I appreciate all of your answers and um, and your exploration of the concept of virtue. But let me pivot for a second on to science and values. Um, which is another thing you talk about. And uh, I like the term that you've come up with, sci-fi, you know, for science right. and philosophy. And, and to quote you once again, you say, our philosophy can and should be informed by the best science available and vice versa. Our quest for scientific knowledge should be guided by our values. Okay, right. again, seems very sensible. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> but what happens in the case where science itself demonstrates that there are no objective values, as, mm -hmm. as some people believe? You know, we can talk about ethics, morality, values, whatever we want to call them. But if, you know, if you take a cold, hard look at the universe, as some people have and have concluded, you know, I don't see any values. I don't see any ethics. You know, I just see either atoms smashing into each other in different configurations, or I see like short, nasty, brutish, you know, ex experience. And I'm just, as you said, just trying to survive. Right. So what does the word value mean in the context of a scientist or a philosopher who concludes that way? Right. That's a, that's a great question. And let, let's see if we can walk through it um, in a sensible way. So I try to strike a middle ground between two positions that I find both problematic and 
in my mind at least, indefensible. Okay. One position is known in philosophy as moral realism. So this is the idea that there are, in fact, absolute rules of morality, of, of moral behavior. The typical moral realist is uh, Kant, for instance, uh, who thinks that you, you just think about it, if you just think rationally uh, about things, then you'll arrive at what he called the categorical imperative, right? This, this notion that... Um, uh, you should never accept any kind of behavior um, uh, as moral unless you would be okay with that behavior being a, a universal uh, rule, right? So, for instance, lying is a bad idea because if everybody went around lying, then we would literally not have a society, right? Mm -hmm. right. Now, of course, the other big chunk of moral realism comes from religious traditions, most religious traditions, not necessarily all of them. Certainly the Abraham, Abrahamic faiths, the, the, the three big ones uh, in the Middle East and, and, uh, and, and West. Why? Well, because there you have, you have God that gives you something, literally gives you something like the commandments or, or any, any, any kind of sort of uh, rule for, for life, and that's it. That's where, it, where morality comes from. So that's one extreme. I think that's not tenable. It's not tenable because I don't think, you know, it, it sounds to me like essentially a moral realist is the moral equivalent, the ethical equivalent of a mathematical Platonist, somebody who believes that there's this kind of realm of ideas that somehow that is somehow mind independent. And I, I don't I cannot make sense of that. I mean, we could go into details but yes, take some yes. time for right. why it doesn't make sense. But it's like it's just a weird way of thinking about it. I don't think uh, that there is any anything any such thing as a mind independent morality or moral rules. Now you go to the opposite extreme and you find a number of different, different ways of being an anti-realist about morality. Uh, and the most obvious one being a relativist, right? Somebody who just says, no, nah, sorry, w whatever I think is one thing, whatever you think is another thing. Uh, one interesting type of anti-realist uh, are, are emotivists who basically say that when we say that something is, good or bad or something is evil etc cetera, etc cetera. all we're doing is just emoting we're just saying i don't like this yes that sounds to me just as bizarre as moral realism because that basically reduces morality to a matter of taste and yeah. i'm having a hard time thinking that my distaste for vanilla ice cream is on the same level as my distaste for rape or genocide uh yes i do have a distaste for rape and genocide as it turns out but i actually have an, uh, an alternative explanation for why we feel moral distaste and that does come from science it turns out that modern cognitive science and evolutionary biology do actually suggest that the reason we have such strong moral feelings of distaste for certain kinds of behaviors is because we share those with other uh, social primates, such as the bonobo chimpanzees, for instance, and that therefore these feelings of strong distaste evolved in us precisely because they favor a pro-social behavior. So bonobo chimpanzees and early humans were not able to articulate why something is morally disgusting or morally acceptable, but they did evolve an instinct for something that is, in fact, acceptable or not acceptable. And interestingly, studies on other primates show that pretty much the, the same kind of things that we would think are moral or immoral, they also find you know, acceptable or, or distasteful, which, is, which means that, to me at least, it suggests that there actually is this third way where you can have a what I call a quasi-realism or a semi-objective morality, meaning that hmm. there are some rules of behavior that make sense and are advantageous if you live in a group with other people. For instance, don't go around beating others at random, right? Uh, don't steal from others. Uh, don't kill others at, at, at random unless there is a good reason for it, et cetera, et cetera. All of those basic things, we... we they're not just shared across human societies. There's basically no cultural variation about that. There's no human society that condones random murder. Uh, they condone death, killing for certain specific reasons. Right. They'll just redefine murder, you know, <laughs> well, as to yes. what is most convenient for them. But yeah. <laughs> sure. But the point is there has to be a reason, and the reason is itself is regulated. Uh, right. There's no society where people just go around randomly and, and, and killing or beating each other up or, or stealing from each other. And the same is true for other societies of 
uh, other primates, for other primate species. Now, the thing is, however, we now live, and by now I mean at least in the last three or 4,000 years, probably more, we live in societies that are far more structured, far larger, and far more complex than, than ancestral human societies. Ancestral human societies were not very different from the kinds of society that we find in bonobo chimpanzees. There were small bands of people mostly related to each other. Right? The estimate by paleoanthropologists is 60, 80, 100 people, usually uh, brothers, sisters, uncles, nephews, and so on and so forth. In those kinds of groups, uh, simple instinctual behavior that has been put in place by natural selection is sufficient to regulate group behavior. You don't need a lot more than that. You don't need Kant to come in and start talking about morality. But once we start having large cities with structured division of labor, with hierarchical structures and so on and so forth, where most people are not related to each other and most people actually don't know even each other, then you need something more. And that was one of the great, I think, insights of the Stoics, and which is one of the, the, the most underappreciated of, of, of those. Uh, the Stoics thought that essentially they came up with a theory of what we would today call uh, uh, moral developmental psychology. They thought, look, naturally speaking, we are like other social animals. We have this instinct for collaboration. We have this instinct for uh, taking care of our kins and our close relatives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But once then we become, we, we get into the age of reason, what they call the age of reason, which starts around eight, nine years old, something like seven, nine years old, and then into adulthood, we start realizing, we start thinking more abstractly, and we start realizing that those kind of instinctive behaviors are just not enough. We need to come up with more articulate rules of behavior because the society at large is, 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 is more complex and we need to uh, coexist not just with our kids and, and, uh, and, uh, and friends, but with potentially thousands or even millions of people. And that's where moral philosophy comes in. That's where we start talking about, okay, so how do we uh, put together rules or, 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 or general uh, ways of behaving that are good for society and that allow individuals to thrive. And there, there is, of course, where we also start having cultural variation, right? Because different cultures are structured in different ways, different societies uh, have different characteristics, so you will find variation. Although, as I said before, far less than you might imagine. I've been talking about the greco roman tradition, but for instance, you find very similar uh, practical applications of ethics in Confucian uh, uh, philosophy in, in China or in, in Buddhist philosophy in India and so on and so forth. So that's my idea. The idea is that, therefore, what we call morality is actually a result of two things, of a natural instinct that they really did evolve organically uh, because we're social animals on the one hand, and that is not universal in the sense that it applies, you know, it's mind independent, but it isn't random either. It's not, it's not completely arbitrary either. On top of which, we as sentient thinking human beings start putting other things which are also, although variable, not random <clears throat> and not arbitrary because they're constrained by facts about human nature, by facts about human societies, right? So there is room for variation uh, but only within certain limits. And the result of all of this is a type of, of ethics that depends on two things, of knowledge about human wants and needs. That's where the science comes in. Facts. We need facts about what makes a society thrive, what makes human beings do well. Uh, and those facts, therefore, are the province, in my mind, of science. Combined with philosophy, meaning... Reasonable thinking, uh, rational thinking. Now, remember, remember, Seneca was saying, you know, reason is nothing other than that. that not, sorry, virtue is nothing other than right reason. So these two things, that's why the sci-fi, that's why the science, the science and the philosophy. Because the science by itself does not tell you enough mm -hmm. to, uh, to identify human values in a, pra in, in a practical fashion. But philosophy by itself cannot either because it cannot do it without knowing facts about the human condition. So one quick follow on to that. And 
I understand what you're saying. Um, the, the science is informing the behavior and um, and sort of pointing the way towards maximizing our cooperation for, for the purpose of survival and, and flourishing. But when I'm listening to it, I'm, tr I'm trying to distinguish like what, what is the difference between that and, you know, the thriving of a termite colony or, you know, a clump of pine trees or, you know, is, is there any particular value that's better for humans to thrive? There, there seems to be something very distinct, you know, about the, the import of the choices that we make um, that seems just somehow different than like, well, this is the way, this is the best way for us to survive and reproduce as, as you have said. Doesn't there seem like there's something in there that's missing? Yes and no. The thing that is missing is, is this stuff here. The, the, the human brain is far more complex, of course, than, than ants and termites and things like that, not to mention forest because trees don't even have brains. What does that mean? It means that we don't just want to survive and reproduce. We want that too, most of the, most of the times. But not just that. We have, uh, again, evolved uh, far more sophisticated requirements for thriving in life than pretty much any other human being. Now, this isn't natural. I don't think this is the result of natural selection. I think this is cultural evolution that has taken off from on the basis of human biology and it start doing its own thing. Once the human br brains became large enough to start uh, entertaining sophisticated thoughts, abstract thinking and stuff like that, then we started having additional needs, evolving, culturally evolving, additional needs such as hey, I want to have a career that is fulfilling. That's got not much to do with, you know, reproduction and, and survival. Um, I want to spend my leisure time in, by traveling, you know, or things like that. Or I want to read a good book or whatever it is that, that uh, tickles your, your fancy. Those things are not direct results of natural selection. Natural selection has nothing to do with that sort of stuff. But natural selection created the brains large enough that now as a byproduct, we do have new needs. And those new needs uh, are far more complex and therefore they require a far more uh, sophisticated ethics than what, what's good enough for chimpanzees, gorillas, and, and, and things like that. But it is important to remember that it started there because if we forget that, then we don't have a naturalistic explanation for ethics. Right, so the, one of the modern, the most influential modern writers, more philosophers in this, uh, in, in this department is Philippa Foote, who wrote a wonderful book called Natural Goodness, where she makes essentially the same argument that I, that I just made. In fact, it's the same argument that Aristotle and the Stoics were, were making. That is, we are connected with other social species, particularly primate species. And that's where we get this old notion and these old instincts about morality and ethics and pro-sociality and stuff like that. But at the same time, now we also want a bunch of other things that other species on Earth don't want. And now how do we get them? Well, you know, <laughs> I cannot spend my life reading, writing, going to a concert or going to a vacation if we are in a, in a, in a Hobbesian state of war and conflict, right? Yeah, just ask the people of Ukraine right now. Yes, yes, I was going to say. Um... Okay, let me ask you, I, I'd like to sort of emote to you as, as a, a theologically minded person for a moment, if that's okay. Sure. Um, it's, not, it's not really emoting, but I'll ask you a two-part question. You write, science is not in the business of delivering permanent truths, but offers instead provisional conclusions that have a certain probability of being true. Right. That makes perfect sense. And, and it's honest. And, you know, I do think that there is a, there, there is some elements of the scientific community that, that certainly speaks with a lot more certainty than, than that. And they should, right. Yeah. But okay. So, you know, there are many studies that are cited. You know, we, we know this because of this study. You know this because of this study. We know that there are retractions and revisions and, you know, things end up changing often, you know. And, and so I think it, it does make sense to have a certain amount of humility and a certain amount of open-mindedness when it comes to scientific conclusions. And, and I appreciate the fact that you, you've written that and that's your position. What I've, what I've found is that when theists uh, or, or spiritually minded people 
they want to use certain scientific or philosophical arguments. So for instance, uh, the argument from biological design, you know, which, which has to do with right. unlikelihood of, uh, of, of even a protein being, you know, randomly assembling and there are mathematical figures and, you know, stats and, and whatnot, or the fine tuning arguments, uh, which has to do with uh, the, the likelihood of the various rates uh, of gravitation, the weak, strong nuclear force and so on being tuned exactly the way they are, the, the great unlikelihood of that, or even big bang cosmology, which seems to point to a certain origin of, of the universe. I, I, I find I've, I've had the, the enormous pleasure over the last year or so of interviewing some of the smartest and most accomplished people I've ever come across uh, in my life. And I find that when I ask some of them these questions, all of a sudden their, their scientific confidence becomes very open and muddled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, well, we don't know what happened in the initial conditions of the universe. Those, that first mm -hmm. fraction of a second, I can't really say. And who knows, you know, science is gonna come up with other ideas to explain it. From my vantage point, there doesn't seem to even be like, uh, an, there doesn't seem to be an openness at a certain point. It comes to sort of like an, an end. No, we won't consider that we won't draw that conclusion right and and i don't know if i have a specific question but but it's more can you reflect upon all of that yeah uh those are all good questions absolutely i i think that i uh, i would agree with my colleagues that you just mentioned that when it comes to certain questions you just have to say i don't know i mean you know if you ask me uh what came before the big bang it's I, nobody knows and moreover in fact i would even go further probably nobody will ever know uh i say probably not not certainly but probably nobody would ever know why well because there are no historical traces left right there is nothing i mean in order for science to work you gotta have some kind of empirical evidence and if the big bang is the kind of process that we think it is there is a sudden fluctuation in a pre-existing quantum singularity, whatever that means. I'm not a physicist. Um, if it is what, if, if it's that, then there is nothing left of assuming that there was something before that might explain the origin of that quantum singularity. Uh, there is nothing left. And if there is nothing left, you are like in a situation of a Sherlock Holmes who has absolutely no traces of the crime. What are you going to do? Um, nothing. So you're just going to say, I don't know. And I think that saying I don't know, not just on, by, on the part of scientists, but on the part of pretty much anybody, is a salutary reminder that, yeah, sometimes that's the only acceptable answer. We don't know. Um, now, in some other cases that you mentioned, I think the reason that scientists tend to be dismissive or skeptical of sort of going into the into the transcendent let's call it the transcendental direction um, <laughs> yes uh, right okay but but rooted in actual science yeah 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 so of course yes yeah but the reason we're you know we tend not to go in those directions is 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 one of two there are basically two reasons one sometimes those arguments are actually bad or have been uh, at this point refuted or or or, or have at, at lost credibility for instance the argument from design you do find the argument from design in ancient sources. Uh, you find it in the Stoics. You find it in, in a lot of the Greek and Romans. And at the time, it made perfect sense. Um, however, after Hume first, and then Darwin next, and then all of 20th century and 21st century science, it doesn't, because we have a lot of good answers, even if there might be tentative and incomplete answers. We have a good answers, for instance, to... Uh, you know, where do the complex biological structures come from? Well, now we have a, a good, a solid science of, uh, you know, to explain the evolution of the, of the eye, for instance, which was one of the classic examples of uh, alleged intelligent design. So I, I looked into, as a biologist, I, I looked for many years into those arguments and just, I just find them wanting at this point. So when, I, when a scientist rejects them and says, now, sorry, there's no need to go there, I, I think they are on fairly solid grounds. The second reason the transcendental option is rejected is because even under situations, in situations where we don't really have an answer at all, let's say the Big Bang, for instance, right? Uh, you know, if the question is what came before the Big Bang. Well, yeah, science doesn't have an answer, but neither does anybody else. Uh, to say something like, you know, well, God did it, it's not really an answer. It's just a fancy label for saying I have no idea what happened there. Um, because unless you can give me some evidence, first of all, that God did it, uh, 
you can tell me something about the structure and functioning of God and how he actually did it. Those would be actually explanations. Those would, would count as explanations. But if you're, only, if you're saying is, well, God did it, that is essentially a, a fancy and unnecessary label to the same thing that I just said, which is, I don't know. And at that point, then, then why do you want to add a, a, an additional label, which, of course, implies a whole other realm of existence of which we have uh, you know, no evidence, no reason to, to think that it's there. So now, does that mean that, it's, that it is not there? Does that, you know, could, could I go so far as saying, no, that clearly God doesn't exist? No, I'm not going to go there. I don't, but, the, but the point is, I don't need to go there because there is no there to, go, to, 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 going, to be going in terms of explanations. It's just not an explanation. At least nothing that counts as what a philosopher and a scientist would consider an explanation. And I think that's why uh, a lot of scientists would, are perfectly comfortable saying, I don't know, but they don't think that that implies anything else other than, I don't know. Can I clarify a little bit? Sure. A little bit more? Okay, so... Even granting regular Darwinian evolution, right? That mm. that that takes hold once you've got a self-replicating cell. You sure. know, my question is more in the abiogenesis realm, like how, how we got from inanimate to animate. Yep. And and in that regard, it seems to me as a, a non not a scientist and not even not a philosopher um, that. The ch it seems to me th that the science says that the chances of that actually happening are so infinitesimally small that you have to, it would be reasonable to posit a cause uh, and, a, and a cause that is ostensibly of great creative ability, massive creative ability, yeah. whatever that cause may be and whatever label we might give to it. Right now, the, you know, the state of play, it seems to me, is a total wall in, in terms of understanding um, how it got that way. And I just want to quote to you really quickly from, from uh, James Shapiro from the University of, of Chicago on... Oh, yeah, I know, I know James. Okay, on evolution <laughs> itself, it just and to get your whole reaction to all this, but he says, Neo-Darwinism ignores much contemporary molecular evidence and invokes a set of unsupported assumptions about the accidental nature of heredity uh, variation. Neo-Darwinism ignores important rapid evolutionary processes such as symbiogenesis, horizontal DNA transfer, and a bunch, bunch of other things. Moreover, some neo-Darwinists have elevated natural selection into a unique creative force that solves all the difficult evolutionary problems without real empirical basis. Um, and, you know, he's got this whole website, which um, is searching for a, the third way in evolution. You know, it, it does mm -hmm. not embrace creationism, does not embrace neo-Darwinism, you know, and is, and is hopeful for some other approach. So <laughs> given all that, you know, especially on the abiogenesis question, right, don't we have some question to look at here? Isn't it some, isn't this a remarkable phenomena? We have lots of questions to look at. I, I wish good luck to James. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he's going to get anywhere. Uh, in fact, he has been trying to do that, what he's been trying to do for a long time and hasn't gone in anywhere. Um, look, the, the origin of life is another one of those things that we may never actually get an answer to. And for the same exact reason that I mentioned before, uh, the original life on Earth, the estimate is, took place between 3.8 and 4.1 billion years ago. Well, there is no rock that survived from that time. So, <laughs> so there is no fossil record. So there's nothing that is going to tell us how it happened. Uh, the only way we, we have to move forward, and in fact, that's the only way that scientists have uh, tried so far is to imagine possible pathways and then do experiments under control conditions to see, well, do those pathways work or, or not? And the result of it is that right now we have at least three or four different possibilities that are at play, none of which is uh, anywhere near where we would like it to be. So the short answer is, we don't know. We have some ideas, unlike the Big Bang, which is better than the Big Bang, because it's part of the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, we have really no idea. Um, but, in, but, but in terms of origin life, we do simply because we can base those ideas on biochemistry, and it's, which is itself based on chemistry. So we, we have some notion of what might have happened. But again, it's one of those crimes, to use the metaphor of Sherlock Holmes, where 
we don't have it's not true that we don't have any evidence at all but we have very little evidence uh, to go by and so i wouldn't be surprised if uh, we wouldn't make much much progress uh you know even in the next several decades but again what does that mean that the only thing that that entails is well, okay so i don't know and when james says you know all that bit about neo-darwinism neo-darwinism was never uh meant to explain the origin of life darwin right. himself is very clear about this right. so to shoot at neo-darwinism as oh they failed to explain the origin of life is like what why are you doing this uh that's like you'll um, have to ask him Right. I, well, actually, lots of people have asked him. Okay. But, you know, so it's, it, it makes no sense to me because it is really trying to use the wrong tool to answer that kind of question. The, quest, the answer isn't going to be of the original life, isn't going to come from neo-Darwinism, it's going to come from biophysics, if it's coming at all, of course. Right. Okay. I think I have time for a while. One and a half more questions, although I'm thoroughly sure. enjoying this conversation. Um, let, we, we, we spoke about, well, you spoke about stoicism. Um, and that is one of your areas of expertise. And, uh, and you mentioned Seneca mm -hmm. and we've spoken about virtue and ethics. And um, I, here's something that I've learned about Seneca. So it, it says the, the wealthy first century Roman philosopher Seneca once wrote, we doom scabby sheep to the knife lest they should inf infect our flocks. We destroy monstrous births and we drown our children if they are born weakly or unnaturally formed. To separate what is useless from what is sound is an act not of anger, but of reason. This from a Stoic who supposedly believed virtue to be the highest good. Notably, yeah. Seneca was Nero's tutor. Um, so is there some kind of contradiction between the Stoic ideals of, you know, of virtue and, and how they actually enacted them? Does the individual child, even if you know, malformed, have value? Um, in in the Stoic realm, or you know, uh, have our values simply shifted over time? Yeah, it's another good question. There's many ways of answering it. One way is by analogy. So, um, as you know, during the Middle Ages and early Renaissance, uh, Christian popes literally went into battle to yeah. slaughter enemies. You know, dressed with with armor. Does that imply that that Christianity is a warmongering sort of religion? I would say no. Right. It just means that those particular people were not enacting a particularly good version of Christianity. So uh, I think that we need to make a distinction between the, the person, uh, the specific person we're talking about, in this case, Seneca, and, the, and what the philosophy entails. Seneca was a really brilliant person. He was a you know, great writer. He was a playwright. Um, and, and he had uh, you know, a really difficult situation in his hands. He, he had to handle the emperor Nero. Uh, for many years, and he apparently did a pretty good job, actually, for several uh, years until eventually things got out of hand, and Seneca paid with his life uh, because he was ordered to commit suicide by Nero. However, ne uh, Seneca was also a human being. In fact, he is he's himself, and he, therefore he's not only flawed, as you know, human beings tend to be, but also the product of his culture and time. The kind of practices you're talking about made perfect sense for ancient Romans. Uh, they were saying, you know, we don't have enough resources to uh, have all these children growing up and, and occupy space and, and taking food. So we need to get to essentially do selection of these things. Is that acceptable for us today? Have, hell no. Uh, it, right. But um, we live in a different and I would say, despite our own flaws, better society. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to go, as much as I love the Greco-Romans, I wouldn't want to uh, find myself living in ancient Athens or ancient Rome unless I was one of the you know, really top elite. And even there, actually, they didn't have as good a life as probably middle class. They didn't have person. plumbing, yeah. That's right. No no plumbing, <laughs> you know, no television series. Okay, wait a minute. That's actually <laughs> a blessing. But, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, Seneca was very honest. If you read his letters, to his friend Lucilius, which is essentially an informal curriculum in Stoic philosophy. He says over and over, he says, like, you know, don't come to me for advice because I'm not a sage. I'm, I'm just sick, as sick as you are. I am simply just slightly ahead of you because I'm older and I, got, I realized earlier that I was sick. But that's about it. Right? Um, so it's, it's endearing in that sense because you are then pr more prone to sort of forgiving for the fact that he was not living 
to the, uh, you know, the, the highest levels of his own philosophy. But there were Stoics who were. Epictetus would probably be my, my choice, my first favorite choice. He was a, a, born a slave at, in the middle part of the first century and uh, became eventually uh, a, one of the most uh, famous and uh, uh, sought after teachers of the early part of the second century. And by all accounts, we don't know a lot, unfortunately, about his life, but all that we know about his life, he really lived his philosophy. He, he really was a modest person with, you know, not interested in, uh, in uh, wealth and fame and stuff like that. And he was trying to do his best to help his students. But I think the broader question really is, when we're talking about either philosophies or religions, by the way, I tend to think of religions as a type of philosophy anyway. So do I. Um, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that the real question is, what does that religion and or philosophy entail logically, uh, as opposed to what did this particular person who claimed to be a Christian, you know, Muslim, Stoic, Epicurean, et cetera, et cetera, actually did. It's always fascinating to study individuals, of course, because philosophies and religions ought to be lived. Uh, and that is, therefore, one good reason to, to look critically, obviously, at the lives of people like Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. You know, Plutarch wrote a, you know entire book on the parallel lives precisely with the notion of teaching us about what good models of, of a human life might be, as well as bad models of a human life, right? This, this was a moral book. And um, so it's really important to look at the lives of these people critically, not as, uh, not as if, if we were looking at heroes or, you know, saints or anything like that. But I think it's far more important to look at what the philosophies themselves say. So, for instance, to come back, to go back to your original example, I think that the, the sort of cultural practices that were common in Rome that you mentioned are not compatible with Stoic philosophy. And the reason for sure. that is because Stoic philosophy is fundamentally about caring for other people. It's a cosmopolitan philosophy. It's a philosophy, therefore, that doesn't recognize natural, uh, you know, national boundaries, that says that we should uh, treat other people as our brothers and sisters. And that's not the kind of thing you would do to your brother or sister. Right. Uh, right. Uh, therefore, if we're talking about what, what does stoicism entail, it certainly would reject that sort of behavior. But Seneca lived in a Roman society of the first century where that kind of behavior was uh, standard. And therefore, he was, he was telling us how things were uh, and, uh, and, and make the best of it. Well, Dr. Pellucci, this has been a really fun and meaningful conversation, and I can't thank, thank you. you enough for having taken the time to uh, speak with me today. And I, I encourage everyone to go out and uh, check out your many volumes that are worth uh, looking at and reading and getting a uh, great TED Talk that you have. Um, and for the audience, please subscribe, like, and share the content today and stay abreast of all the great content that we have coming up now and going forward. Thank you all for being here.